So uh, welcome everyone, uh, all of you who joined us this afternoon. Uh, we'll uh, get a special edition today of our regular Antiquity Circle lecture, because this time around we are joined by Brooklyn-based artist Mark Babe, uh, whose uh, disembodied voice you just heard as well. Uh, his work explores the interaction of politics and ideology with art and beauty standards. In the first half uh, of this program, we will discuss Mark's cycle. Uh, when I say we, Mark and I, will discuss his cycle of works and the relevance of antiquity for our modern society. In the second part, we will present a concept uh, for an exhibition idea that will recontextualize both Mark Babe's work and the Antiquities Collection of the Tampa Museum of Art. Um, for those of you uh, who may have questions during our presentation or conversation, please feel free to uh, use the raise hand function, write your comments in the chat, or if you are joining us today via Facebook, leave a comment in the live stream. Uh, Mark, may I ask you to turn on your video oh, and uh, to unmute yourself as well. Hi, welcome on our program today. How are you? Very well, can't complain. I'm very glad that uh, you can join us today. And um, I um, would like to uh, let the audience know that you are not just an artist, you are also a marketing strategist. So I'm wondering, do you see a connection between art and marketing? Uh I mean, I don't know if I think of it in terms of a connection between between art in general and marketing in general, but certainly for me, um, uh, for me, there's a strong connection between the two. So um, uh, basically, you know, so my background is originally I was, well, I went to Brown and studied history there. And then in Columbia, I studied journalism and started my career as a magazine writer um, and then switched into marketing strategy. And in both of these fields, right, that I've spent really most of my most of my working life in, at the end of the day, what you're looking to do is to come up with a singular, differentiated insight. You're looking to say something that others aren't saying or aren't saying in the same way. You're looking to express it precisely. And you spend a fair amount of time, particularly, of course, in marketing, thinking about the audience. Okay, so mm -hmm. not just about here is me and here's what I want to say about me and what I think, but you take into account what is it really that I'm looking for the readers, viewers of this to be to be thinking about. So, so there is a strong connection. Another one is, of course, that in a sense, um, in a sense, as a as a marketing strategist, you are and you could be described as a practitioner of propaganda. Propaganda is a big theme throughout my work. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, being an artist in a way is also a nice reprieve because I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do I get people or how do we get people to engage in a certain behavior. And uh, as you know, and maybe we will talk about in this session also, um, my work is quite different. My work is decidedly not about me and, what, and, and really about what I think, because who cares? I'm much more interested in getting a getting a thought process started for continuing it in the in the viewer. So, so it's, if uh, I, it's not if about I can getting people to arrive at a certain point of view. If I can interject, Mark, there is uh, in art and marketing a form of communication that they both share. And then you say you have a running theme in your work uh, that is propaganda. Uh, so that's a very strong word. People usually have a negative association with that. Can you explain a little bit how you came to uh, find that that would be a running theme in your work? It's, uh, you know, propaganda has, has, has fascinated me um, basically since, since I was quite young because uh, I thought it was amazing that, uh, that thought and ideas um, uh, could, have, uh, could influence people so much. And uh, you know, because of my family history, so I'm so I'm German Jewish. So my my family suffered a lot in the Holocaust. Uh, my family also defected from communism. So of course, we've had like our our family experiences being on the receiving end of propaganda. So you could imagine that that would be a topic that 
you know, as an adult, would interest me quite a bit. You know, how can you, how can, how are ideas and thoughts used to get people to, you know, engage in certain behaviors, not engage in certain behaviors, believe certain things, et cetera. Yeah, of course, that is where the negative association with the word propaganda comes from, from uh, fascist Germany, communist Russia, and so on. Um, of course, the word itself is not uh, necessarily negative. It's a way of uh, promoting your ideas, uh, but it has a strong association with power. Um, yet the cycle of works uh, that you have created uh, the first one is called Mask of Perfection. How does that theme uh, relate back to propaganda then? Um, Mask of Perfection is the, as you know, it's the only one of my work that isn't part of the Imperium cycle. So the, what really matters about Mask of Perfection, um, that work is really a dive into, uh, into, into beauty and what beauty means um, uh, on the one hand, we find that standards of beauty have been relatively consistent um, uh, over history. Um, and at the same time, um, our reactions to beauty have been quite different in different periods, uh, in different periods in history. Um, and of course, in Mask of Perfection, uh, I don't know if we, hold on, I don't know if I'm in the right view. Do we have a picture of it up? Not yet, right? No. So in Mask of, I can describe it. I can describe it. In Mask of Perfection, what, what we um, what we did was we uh, we took a, a group of uh, of young women uh, who, by conventional standards, would be perceived as as beautiful, and we had a plastic surgeon mark them up for perfection, like the things that 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 um, that one would have to quote unquote improve in these already very beautiful people. Like um, in order when they're to not get symmetrical them. or a little blemish. Um, but Precise. even that, the whole beauty standard is a form of propaganda of the, the cosmetics, of the fashion industry. Uh, uh, and that is, in a, in a way, an expression of, um, of ideology. Uh, yeah. And so uh, it, it does have some connections back to uh, the cycle that uh, we'll be talking more about today. So uh, if Mask of Perfection doesn't belong to it, I still think that there are some no. uh, commonalities. It might be a bit of a, a pilot, but you consider the first part of your cycle to be Mischlinge. That's a German word, not particularly neutral, I believe. It's quite controversial, I think. Uh, but when you did that show, how did the public react to it? And explain a bit to the audience because we cannot illustrate it right now, uh, what you meant to do with Mischling, uh, which yeah, Mischling, translates to what mongrels, yes, inbreeds, negative. Mischling it translates in English. In English, it means mongrels, and it was intended to be. Uh, it was intended to be uh, really an abusive term. So Mischling was is a term. That the, that the Nazis had applied really from early on, but then became also a legal term through the Nuremberg laws. Okay, so uh, so a Mischling, uh, they had been Mischling of various degrees, but basically affects like how Jewish somebody was. You know, so if you were a Mischling of first degree, you were half Jewish, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, and so it was intentionally intended as a as a term of abuse. In the work Mischling, we turn that we turn that on its head because the whole work is basically shows um, that uh, it shows that there was no such thing ever as like a pure Aryan mm -hmm. or Nordic race. That in fact all Germans are Mischling of something. And to drive that home, we actually we had a cast of about 34 Germans from various backgrounds. Some very well known, other people not well known. Um, some with very unique uh, links to the Nazi past, okay? And we DNA tested them as part of the project. So you have, uh, when, you, when you look at one of these images, as you know, Branko, when you look at the, the text underneath, there, the DNA test results are, uh, are published. So then you see that some people who strike you as looking very sort of to the, to the ideal that the Nazis would have had, Actually, do not live do not live up to that standard at all. No. The and reason why we did that, it, 
you, you, you showed it in Germany and in other countries. How did the public receive it? So, uh, yeah, with my work, so with Mischling and with Unter Afrika in particular, the expectation before it launches is often that people get very worried that there's going to be some kind of scandal, and then the scandal doesn't happen at all. So, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, so the reactions to Mischling uh, um, were, they were like resoundingly positive. The only negative critique that we've ever received was one that we were very happy to get, because it was uh, essentially from a neo-Nazi publication. They really hated the work, which of course was great uh, to see the that they recognized exactly. the, the criticism. You... But otherwise, no, people, you know, I think that um, with works that are deemed sort of provocative or enter into territories that are, um, uh, that are not so comfortable necessarily, or that address these issues, uh, in ways that are not so common, there is a fear that uh, there is sometimes a fear that they will be, get a negative reaction. But I think mm -hmm. um, that often is because people tend to, particularly people in the field of art, tend to underestimate the intellect of the of the viewer. So yeah. we had really only positive with, reactions with with the second uh, episode of your cycle, Unza Africa, which translates into Our Africa. Um, I believe that. Uh, that is uh, a work where you address racism, colonialism, imperialism, uh, uh, relations between North and South. Um, do these topics still play a role in Germany? There are obviously people watching today that uh, do not really have a sense of how that still is. Is Germany a multicultural society with, uh, with tolerance or uh, how does the col colonial past still play a role in, in German society? Two separate, there are two separate answers to this. If we talk about racism, of course, in Germany, in Germany, like in all societies, you know, you can't say that it's a society that has, that has purged itself from the vestiges of racism or that it doesn't exist. Uh, of course, in the German case, there has been more than in other societies an effort to an introspection for obvious historical reasons, okay? But the really interesting aspect in Germany as it relates to racism is um, goes to the very definition of what makes a German. So in the US, if you have an American passport, you're an American full stop, right? Whereas in Germany, um, there is, even to this day, there is a distinction between you know, being of German heritage versus being, uh, being a German citizen, right? So, uh, so that is a particular topic that feeds into both work. As it relates to colonialism, just real quick, um, Germany has a, has a bit of a particular relationship with its colonial past for a couple of reasons. One, because they were a colonial power only for about 40 years, okay? Second, because they lost the colonies before, before say, Britain and France lost their colonies. So German colonies were all gone in 1919 as a result of the Treaty of Versailles, right? So um, it became then uh, really in post-war Germany, it became a sort of a forgotten episode. People really didn't think about it much. Most people nowadays don't know even much about it. If you ask them, name some German former colonies, they might know of Namibia, but really not much more. So it's yeah, forgotten. I can share it's a bit that. of a forgotten subject. And uh, just, just one thing I want to add, it's also a bit of a repressed subject in Germany because you can imagine in a society that is so concerned with the Holocaust and what happened in, under the Nazis, the last thing is you need, is that you want to think about are more genocides committed by your people, right? So there's a bit of a resistance to get into this subject. Sorry, Branko. No, no, the, it's a good addition. Uh, I was just uh, wanting to share that I'm from the Netherlands uh, and uh, Dutch history has about 300 years of imperialism and colonialism, both in the Americas and in Africa, uh, and also in, uh, in Asia, particularly in Indonesia. Uh, and still people after 300 years, and it's been a while, of course, since uh, the Netherlands was a, a colonial power, but now in the Netherlands, most people have no idea and uh, there are obviously people from Indonesia, from Suriname living in our country. And most people have essentially forgotten how they came here and how that relates to, to history. Um, but of course, just as in Germany, just as is in your work, some of these elements still play a role in, in society. Um, 
some of the people who logged in a bit earlier before one o'clock today may have seen that uh, we have now two prints from your work Pantheon put on display, uh, particularly uh, or specifically in the exhibition called Her Story. Um, with Pantheon, of course, you are deliberately interacting with antiquity, specifically Roman history. Um, what, what was the thought process or aim uh, with Pantheon? Pantheon is, in a sense, Pantheon is my, in a weird way, Pantheon is my most personal work in a strange way. I think it would be missing it because of my background, but in other ways, Pantheon really is. Uh, you know, um, I like things that are a bit controversial. I guess that was even the case when I was a kid, when I fell in love with ancient Rome. I was fascinated by it, okay? And I am to this day. Uh, Rome gets a bad rap, right? I mean, if you have a civilization that made enemies with three world religions and still exists to this day and have sort of built it anti-Roman uh, things into their own propaganda, right? Um, there is a lot of negativity toward ancient Rome. But what I wanted to show with this work was really that there are sides to it that, uh, that are actually quite, uh, quite enlightened and quite forward-looking. So first and foremost, I would say that Rome was the, you could make a good argument that Rome was the first universal association, uh, the first universal civilization, I'm sorry. It was the first civilization that you could join and become a member of. You couldn't do that in, in Athens. You couldn't do it in quite the same way in Greece. But you could, like St. Paul, you could become Roman, genuinely Roman, and be covered by Rome's laws, regardless of your ethnicity, your race. That did not matter if you were, if you were a Roman. And you see That's that in every facet and aspect there, of Roman society. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. People um, forget that they they will they they imagine that Rome would impose their politics, their religion, their laws, and their uh, that you could only be a citizen if you're either rich or you were born in uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, in a sense, indeed, Rome was a, a multicultural society, adopted many thoughts from from other countries. Um, but you're doing a, a, a few other things too. There are beautiful reconstructions. Uh, you play with with gender and with beauty ideals again uh, in Pantheon. Um, did you get any feedback? Did you uh, uh, consult with experts on the in this field, or did you do your own research? A good question. So actually, because uh, and I and I hadn't mentioned it to this point, but um, really one thing, and for me again, it's a bit of a natural coming from coming from professions that that really have to do with research. Each of the works, um, each of the works actually has a panel of really leading experts, uh, leading experts in that field. That goes from Mischlinge, where we had leading leading historians of the Third Reich and of racial laws, for the Afrika, where where really the panel is is synonymous with the leading colonial German colonial historians. And in Pantheon, we had outstanding uh, classical scholars. Um, involved from involved really from various perspectives, from from the historical down to down to the aesthetics and uh, and bringing uh, Roman uh, Roman fashion and design translating into a 21st century context. So yeah, mm -hmm. having experts as part of the work um, is um, there's no substitute for it, and I couldn't really imagine working working without it because I think it allows you to bring something that is much more uh, substantive and uh, and intelligently thought provoking and multi dimensional to the to the audience. Yeah, and of course, your first two uh, Mischling and Unser Afrika uh, are related to Germany, uh, but now the step you you turn to Rome, uh, but still you're talking about propaganda, imperialism. Uh, you're talking about subverting some of the preconceived notions. Um, and then in your most recent work, you suddenly uh, go to Egypt. Uh, yesterday, tomorrow is the title of this uh, of this work. Um, I feel that you are reviving the canon of ancient Egyptian visual representations. The uh, the proportions of uh, Egyptian art is something that I recognize in this work. Um, what was your thought process here? And before you answer. Uh, I'll apologize to the audience. I'm sure that they wish they could see images. They will come after this. 
Um, but uh, explain a bit here uh, your thought process. Why suddenly go to Egypt? That was, the, so the irony is that it all started with my wife and I were looking for a vacation destination and I had to promise her it wouldn't turn into an art project. So we picked Egypt because I've never been interested particularly in, in Egypt. There was just, there was not going to be an art project. Of course, it turned out maybe to be uh, in some ways the biggest of the art projects. Here's what happened. Um, so being somebody who originally comes from the written word, more from more than from the world of images, okay? Um, I'm acutely aware, I was acutely aware of the limitations that images have. So it's hard to say certain even basic things with a single image. How do you- So image, you disagree image, with, the, with the proverb, an image says more than a thousand words? I think they say it differently. I think that an image, of course, an image is more visceral and it and it, it hits you more than than text which is which is abstract but uh, but uh, but images don't lend themselves for precise for the same kind of precise expression um as text can okay so think about it this way in a single image how do you express the notion of but right even something as simple and basic as that it's hard to express with it with an image so all of my work long story short all of my work combined text, right? As you know, Pantheon does, Mischling it did, okay? But even in these combinations, I felt there was something that that wasn't going as far as it could, okay? Because if you think about it in our in our own Greco-Roman system, when you when even when you have a speech bubble, but certainly when you have a caption, so you're combining image and text, but you can still know exactly where does the image end and where does the text begin. And I felt in that separation, there were just limitations to my, to my expression. So I started thinking about what could be a better way. Okay, what does this have to do with Egypt? I'm gonna share the screen for a moment so you guys can all see. Um, so we were traveling to Egypt and for, for the first week, I was able to keep true to my promise to my wife that it wasn't gonna turn into an art project. And then on the 1st of January, very funny, on the 1st of January of 2016, we were visiting the temple of Seti the first in Abydos in Upper Egypt, okay? And we saw, I saw this relief and okay, it's sort of a standard scene, but suddenly after a week of seeing ancient Egyptian art, something hit me and it was this. You mm -hmm. see the Ankh symbol? Now most of us know the Ankh symbol, right? And I had known it as a symbol, but I suddenly here, I see it as part of the image, as an element of the image. So I'm starting, I'm seeing, aha, uh -huh, the symbol and the symbol itself is, is used as a, as, a, as a key element in this image where the God basically blesses the Pharaoh with the egg. So then I start looking and scrolling through the hieroglyphs and I'm wondering, I wonder if this symbol that is used as an image element is also text. And there, of course, we see it, right? And we see it again, we see it again here. Underneath the Ankh sign on the staff that the god holds in front of the pharaoh, there's also the jet pillar. So he is not only offering him life, he's also offering him endurance. Uh, in other words, immortality. Yes. It's, um, it's um, you know, so when you have the, when I see that the Ankh is both a symbol, text, right? and part of the action of the image as a whole. That made me think, wait a second, this, what we see here in this formal language of ancient Egyptian art, that could be the answer that I had been looking for. That could be, that could be an integration of image, symbol, and text into a unified, into a unified integrated whole that might be able to, that might allow me to express things that one couldn't express with, with combinations of images and 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 text well so still a logical step even though it wasn't planned um i have just time for one more question before we can turn uh, to the next part um so we have to keep this short but um just in general what do you think the relevance of antiquity is for our contemporary diverse society so uh... I think the fundamental is that there, there isn't one antiquity, right? I mean, you're talking about a huge time span of, uh, if, if we think about it, the time span that we describe as antiquity 
is longer than the time that has passed since the end of antiquity exactly. than today by a factor of about three or four, right? Yeah, so there isn't where one, you begin, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there isn't, if you go back to say 4,500 to 500, right? That's uh, 5,000 years and there's only been 1,500 since. So it's a huge span of chronology. It's a huge span of, of civilization, right? That we're talking about. But at the same time, I will say that in many ways, particularly when we look at civilizations, I think like, uh, like Rome or, the, uh, or uh, the Alexandrian Empire, or when we, talk about, um, when we talk about ancient Egypt, we find societies uh, and conditions, geopolitical conditions that are more akin to the present day than in the period between 500 and, 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 uh, and 2000, you know? Um, you find you find very very similar issues between really um, uh, of concerning oneself with the with the pursuit of universals, with the tensions between universals and particulars, with uh, particularism, um, with uh, tribalism versus looking to overcome tribalism. On the other hand, um, with progress itself and the questioning of and the questioning of progress. And fundamental questions, also since you were speaking about diverse society, um, issues of uh, issues of, of tolerance. So just to bring a, a basic, uh, to raise a basic theme, um, there are many arguments that are made that in antiquity people didn't have the concept, didn't have in their heads the concept of race the way that we do in our society, because in many ways it's a construct of more recent centuries, right? Even in societies where where distinctions between between ethnicities were uh, were remarked upon or and even viewed as negatively, it was not it was not the same. So you you have in these some of these ancient societies like Rome, you have societies that uh, you could make an argument are in some ways uh, ahead of us um, uh, in in certain regards. Okay, I would also mention, for example. Um, the, the, the syncretism, right, that we have in ancient societies um, is uh, in ancient pagan societies um, is something that may be ahead of, of our time. So syncretism means that rather than viewing any other doctrine, a religious doctrine as opposed uh, to whatever doctrine you may hold or not, right, uh, that you are willing to and open to and actually embrace seeing the parallels and potentially even embracing um, uh, and, and uh, these these other elements and incorporating them into your own religious doctrine, Look, right? I'm, so. I'm going to stop it here. We can continue this perhaps after the pitch, but otherwise uh, we're going to be pressed for time. Brittany, are there any particular questions we could address before moving on to the proposal? We don't have any questions in the chats or the Q&A. However, Robert Isbell does have his hand raised that may be left over from letting me know about the feedback, but I'm gonna allow him to talk. Oh, and Barbara Stubbs has also raised her hand. So I will give yep. them a moment. Bob, did you have a question? Barbara, if, not, you... if not, you can lower your hand the same way you raised it. That's fine. I, I was concerned about uh, the feedback, which was yeah. quite intrusive. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was, uh, Bob. Thanks. So, Barbara, did you have a question? Looks like she has since lowered her hand. All right. So, uh, Brittany, if you could uh, share your screen so we can uh, start the presentation. Um, with a working title production, Supremacy, Empire and Antiquity, um, we're presenting uh, something of a retrospective of Mark Babe's work, but recontextualized uh, with the Antiquities Collection of, of the Tampa Museum of Art and um, hopefully sculpture, statues and reliefs from a third party that would not only be a contributing partner in terms of objects, but uh, who would hopefully also become a third venue for this uh, exhibition idea. Uh, we have not contacted anyone just yet, but this is the pitch uh, that we uh, would like to uh, present today. There are three main parts and each of these will have uh, uh, three sections 
so if we can move to the next slide uh, uh, and uh, the next again. There we go. So the first theme is unifor uniformity. Uh, we've spoken about propaganda. One of the things that propaganda uh, aims for is conformity, uh, the us versus them mentality, an adherence to a code that includes also a dress code. Um, this kind of uniformity is an expression of power. It's uh, to convey domination, but also colonization and convey supremacy. So here you see two works of Mark. Uh, the photograph uh, is from Unser Afrika. Uh, and then on the left, the viewers see one of uh, the prints that is from uh, yesterday and today where Mark plays with this Egyptian visual arts uh, and re uh, revives that for our modern society. Uh, uniformity also has a second theme, and that is secrecy. Brittany, if you can move it to the next slide. Secrecy means sharing your secrets with uh, your fellow uh, conspirators, the atrocities that you commit, the killing, the maiming, the looting, uh, but also you share the psychological trauma that is the inevitable consequence of these atrocities. Uh, Mark, perhaps you can uh, explain what is happening in the photo. This photo is called Vogelsang, and in the back you see a torch bearer. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, this is this is an image from from Mischlinge, Okay, and remember, in Mischlinge we're showing Germans of today, um, literally in the shadow of the Nazi past. In this case, at Vogelsang, which is the former Nazi party elite training school. Okay. And, uh, and the work really plays with our own perceptions and, of course, the, 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 the ideology of, of Nazi Germany. So you see this very menacing, skinhead-looking, threatening and guy in a Gestapo coat, and you think, boy, he fits the, uh, he fits the stereotype. But remember, DNA tested everybody. So if you look at the DNA test, the guy test is 94% European Jewish, which is no coincidence because that's my... That's my cousin, who is actually yeah. a well-known actor exactly. in Germany. So, so we're really playing you know, with this intersection of, 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 of a certain aesthetic, in this case, the aesthetic of Leni Riefenstahl, um, and, uh, and of the externalities and, uh, and actual reality, and how yeah. easily they can be misperceived. I find uh, uh, also a kind of poetic irony in the fact that in the background, there's the torchbearer which uh, an American audience would probably uh, uh, think of the Rockefeller Center, the Prometheus um, uh, that is from the uh, Art Deco period, but both of course are referring to Prometheus, uh, the, uh, the Greek mythological figure who stole the secret of fire from the gods. Uh, and for this, he was punished. He was bound to the rocks in the Caucasus mountain and every day an eagle would pick at his liver. Uh, why specifically the liver? Well, that was the seed of emotions according to the Greeks and Romans. Um, there are very few uh, ancient objects actually that illustrate Prometheus, despite the fact that he was uh, in a way uh, the founder of civilization. Um, but when Greeks or Romans depicted him, they focus on the punishment. Uh, so that uh, the, the, the stealing, the secret, the knowledge that he, that he took, uh, he was punished for that. Uh, and of course, knowledge is something very dangerous. Like fire that he stole, it can be destructive. Um, and uh, Brittany, if you could move to the next slide, we come to uh, the third part of uniformity, uh, which of course is, I think, the first thing that people think about when you talk about uniform, you think about a military in their uniforms. Um, and in that respect, I guess that this slide speaks quite for itself, uh, except Mark, you play very nicely with gender stereotypes because here you put an attractive young woman in uh, something that really looks like uh, a Roman military outfit. And on the relief on the left, uh, the viewers will see a depiction of uh, how Romans like to see themselves in their military uniforms. And the beautiful 
uh, vase from the Tampa Museum collection. Uh, I've used this several times in my lectures because it's such a marvelous uh, vase. It uh, shows you a Napoleon and an Oscan warrior, uh, showing you that you can also recognize different soldiers by the uniform that they wear. It's an expression of identity and it's an expression of power. Uh, and um, uh, of course, this whole thing plays in with your themes of propaganda, of imperialism, uh, and in this uh, particular case, Roman imperialism. Um, may we see the next slide? We come to uh, the second theme then, which is aesthetics. Um, and here, uh, of course, we're thinking particularly about beauty ideals, beauty standards. Um, in your first work, uh, Mask of Perfection, you already played with it uh, and you were criticizing or, or at least questioning the need to cosmetically alter uh, uh, human appearances. Uh, in the photo on, uh, on this slide, uh, we're taking that one step further and we're going into the uh, pseudoscientific definitions of race uh, of, uh, and proportions. Um, and that is something that uh, will lead to another form of supremacy, mainly identifying beauty and therefore uh, dehumanizing the other that does not fit that uh, uh, beauty ideal. Uh, whether that person is of another race or maybe even of another social class, if you cannot fit into that beauty standard, then you are no longer part of the in crowd. Um, in, uh, in Greek and Roman uh, ideals, there were, of course, also beauty standards. Uh, we see here the beautiful uh, Venus torso from the TMA collection and then a relief scene of the Arapakis, that means the uh, the altar of peace that was established uh, right at the foundation of the Roman Empire um, to emphasize the fact that the Roman Empire would bring peace rather than war. Of course, this happened after uh, uh, centuries of warfare that the Romans committed in Italy, and the peace only uh, lasted in Italy itself. Um, but interestingly, Mark, you do this, Brittany, can you move to the next slide? Because you turn this image on its head. Um, in Unser Afrika, you have the same setup, but what is happening here? Well, it's a, so it's, it's an inversion, right? So remember all the works are really connected as part of a cycle and designed to be as part of a cycle in a number of ways. So obviously here you're using the measuring caliper twice, right? And this measuring caliper in the previous, in the previous image that you saw, which was from Michelin, it was of course a hint at, uh, at, uh, at Nazi racial doctrine, right? Uh, here we see it in a, in a colonial context, but with the, with the roles, uh, the inverse of what you would expect. Right, it's not the uh, it's not the the white person who's measuring and assessing um, the the African woman, but the other way around. Um, we um, we took great pains, and she did a wonderful job. At uh, the the African woman, did a, who is from the from the Nama culture in Namibia, uh, has sort of the scrutinizing, skeptical look that you would usually see on the on the face of, of the white scientist holding the caliper. Right, so it is, it's an inversion and, and of uh, of power um, yeah. that's happening in this image, and of course mm -hmm. a, a, a point of challenge at how something that was as almost universally as accepted as racial doctrine was in the first half of the of the last century, uh, and before that, how we now view things differently. In antiquity, there are very few. Uh, self-representations of people from uh, from Africa, from um, uh, Ethiopia or elsewhere. Um, the exception being the time when uh, Nubian pharaohs ruled in Egypt and then they portrayed themselves uh, and uh, you can then maybe see if they emphasized certain uh, ethnic features uh, that were different um, with Hatshepsut, you've made a beautiful uh, 3D print, uh, imagining uh, what she may have looked like. Um, and 
uh, here, therefore, the question is always, uh, how would other people have presented themselves had uh, objects remained? Uh, because the sad thing in history is, of course, that the victors leave the history, leave the artifacts, uh, and the vanquished remain silent and invisible. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, here, there's another form of power uh, where aesthetics uh, and artistic creation come into play. Um, we spoke about the pharaonic canon of proportions. Uh, every human being of a certain statue uh, or status in society was depicted with the exact same proportions. And Mark, here you are uh, showing, as it were, a statue being made um, by, uh, by, by a sculptor, right? Uh, but, Correct. It's this, and it's a statue. It's a statue of. Uh, importantly, it's a statue of, of the king being made, uh, being created by by a sculptor. So, so basically, it's about fashioning the image, fashioning the public image, right? In, in this case, in a, in, a, in a literal way, right, of a um, of a ruler in a society that was uh, ancient Egypt was, of course, a society that was highly uh, concerned with with symbolism and with image and with uh, with a consistent uh, with a consistency of image um so it, this is very much about the deliberate crafting of an image in in yep. literal and in more figurative forms as well the two objects from the temple museum of uh, of art on the left uh, you see how uh, in greece uh, black people were portrayed and to me this is almost like blackface uh, and you're, it's very difficult for us to know if this is a, an image that meant to uh, uh, stereotype, uh, or is, is it even a caricature, or is this a sign of respect, uh, or is this almost as demonic as the figure on the right, which, if you look closely, almost reappears in, in Mark's work, uh, the, the stunted figure on the top register uh, behind, uh, in front of the two dancers, uh, Bess, the figure on the right, uh, is also a stunted figure. But here, the othering of the enemy becomes even more prominent uh, because it's almost a form of demonization, where uh, the beauty ideal is turned upside down into, uh, let's say, an uglification, um, which dehumanizes the opponent. Our final theme is the ever after, Brittany. Um, death, of course, uh, is the uh, inevitable end of all life. Uh, but death is also the immediate consequence of any form of imperialism because warfare and battle always cause death. Um, and the interesting thing is we saw the Arapakis, the altar of peace that Emperor Augustus established. Well. On the other side, we haven't shown that, um, there's an image of Roma Bellatrix. It hasn't survived, so it's even uh, uh, very well, so it's also not a particularly nice image, but that means the personification of warfare, a, a female figurine who is representing the, the fact that you cannot have peace without the threat of war. Um, the killing of the enemy, uh, as you see on the relief here, where the enemy is deliberately depicted as other in another uniform. Uh, they're scared, they're dying, whereas the victorious, glorious Romans uh, are trampling over the dead. Um, in the center, you see a beautiful vase from the TMA where a heroic soldier uh, is being honored in a temple-like construction. Uh, that would have been set up in relief form uh, in a grave. Um, but ultimately, of course, in the 20th century, this has led to the deliberate annihilation of the other, uh, where the glorification of the victor uh, also meant uh, the extermination of an entire people. Uh, and that is something, Mark, that you commemorate in this photo uh, um, that uh, you see on the right. Should I, in this photo, because it's so particular, should I explain quickly what's going on sure. in it? So, because this is really about, you know, the um, the valuing or the the 
the assessing, if you will, of, of a death. So what you see here are, is this is shot in, uh, in the Jewish cemetery, the main Jewish cemetery of my hometown, Frankfurt, where also my grandmother is buried. And uh, what you see here are two, two uh, uh, German Jewish women of today uh, in front of these gravestones of Jenny Kahn and Dr. Karl Kahn. And if you look more closely at the image, uh, at the gravestones, you will see that they have the same death date. Um, that's because they committed suicide. Um, in fact, you have uh, in, a tip, in a Jewish cemetery, typically, um, the suicides, because of religious doctrine, the suicides are usually put into sort of a separate corner and not exactly the most accessible corner. But uh, there were so many uh, German Jews who, before their deportation, in this case in 1942, who committed suicide rather than go on those trains. Uh, and the circumstances were deemed so uh, unusual and previously unimaginable that even at the time in the Jewish cemetery, they decided, yes, that the, that the suicides would be in a separate uh, row, if you will, actually like a separate little street, if you will, but not in the corner where, where suicides go because the, the, the circumstances were, um, were something that had never been, if you will, mentally provisioned for. So here you have you know, German Jews of today in the shadow of, you know, happened not that terribly long ago. Exactly. And that takes us to our next slide, Brittany, um, because uh, the commemoration of the dead is something that uh, in any community takes uh, a, a large part of, uh, of life uh, in modern times, much less than in antiquity, actually. Funerary customs were meant to commemorate the dead, to preserve uh, uh, their memory, uh, whether it's through burial, cremation, mummification, or any other form. It is a form of respect for the deceased. Funerary uh, customs are, or practices are, of course, also a way to deal with death. Um, and often it involved some kind of hope for a blessed afterlife in the underworld um, through mystery cults, maybe hoping for the blessing of Demeter, Persephone, Dionysus, or in Egypt, Osiris, uh, and so on. And ultimately, the next step, and the next slide, Brittany, um, would be immortality, to share the divine power through deification. Uh, a concept that is very alien to us, but in antiquity, uh, not that uncommon. Uh, rulers like Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, were worshipped either in their life or after their death uh, as divinities. Uh, but the promise of heaven that Christianity brought uh, is in a way uh, quite similar. The Romanization of the, excuse me, the Christianization of the Roman Empire uh, is perhaps the most lasting legacy uh, of antiquity. Um, and uh, what I aim to show here, uh, and I think Mark too, is that Christianity and the promise of heaven includes a solar cult from antiquity. Uh, think of Apollo, Helios, Sol Invictus, or even other solar gods, sun gods, uh, Ra, Amun, uh, or uh, you name it. Uh, and uh, of course, the finger that I'm showing is the hand of Constantine pointing toward that promise uh, of heaven. Um, in the TMA collection, we have a photograph of this hand together with the head of Constantine. Uh, it's from the Bill Zawatsky photography collection. Unfortunately, we do not have a good digital copy of it, otherwise I would have shown that here. Um, but uh, let me wrap this up uh, because we're pressed for time. Uh, Brittany, if you can show us the uh, next slide. Um, this, the exhibition idea that uh, we are trying to pitch today is a recontextualization, both of the antiquities collection of the TMA, as well as Mark Babe's work in some kind of, let's say, unconventional retrospective. Uh, we would like to find a third party to offer us sculpture, to finish the presentation in a way similar to what uh, we have shown today. Um, the, um, 
uh, how do I say that the aim that I see for me, and this uh, could lead to the next slide, Brittany, is to show that antiquity is still relevant for us today, not only in art uh, or from a historical point of view, uh, academically interesting. No, antiquity is still relevant uh, because there are common themes uh, that uh, we can uh, revisit. Uh, we can even learn from antiquity um, about, as Mark pointed out, uh, the tolerance towards different religions, towards different peoples, um, the, uh, not even tolerance, but often the welcoming uh, of other uh, cultures uh, is something that uh, we can learn from, I think, still today. Um, so one more slide uh, to thank you for, um, for being here today. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will continue, if you can, to patronize the museum, to visit uh, and uh, wander around the museum uh, and enjoy the artworks. Um, for now, we have about five uh, or 10 minutes left uh, for questions. If there are any from the audience, uh, we'd love to address them. Uh, and uh, you could uh, uh, turn off the, the presentation, Britain. Is there anything in the chat? Is there anyone who uh, would like to have a, a moment? Not at the unmute? moment. If anyone wishes, they can raise their hand or ask to be unmuted. There is nothing. Someone has a question, but is struggling to ask it. Would you like to unmute yourself and, and give it a try? <laughs> Brittany, can you help here? Yes, go ahead. It's Pindi. I'm uh, one of the docents uh, at TMA. Good to see both of you and um, thank you for this opportunity to ask a question. Um, I don't know how to articulate it. I was struck by, um, uh, is, can I call you Mark? <laughs> um, Mark, your, your, um, your images, they, they're, they're, they're wonderfully, um, they make a wonderful contrast to the um, the, the panels or the relief and also to the uh, pieces from our um, antiquities section. I'm curious as to why you chose to make them so stark. There's almost a, a cold clinical quality to them as opposed, you know, in juxtaposition to the, um, the more flowing, um, organic pieces. And I, I would just like to hear your thoughts on that. Good question. It is a good question. It's, um, it, I think the starkness plays out. If we had images from the different works next to each other, um, it would read differently. So for example, what reads in Mischlinger is very stark. In Pantheon, it might be more of like a cool kind of elegance, if you will. But, uh, but you know, in, in part, it comes from the subject matter. So if you look at the images from Mischlinger, for example, the work that deals with Nazi Germany, um, that work is, is, um, is created very intentionally in the aesthetic of Leni Riefenstahl, okay? who was, of course, Hitler's, really Nazi Germany's primary propaganda filmmaker and sort of the person whose aesthetic is the most in our heads when we think of that time, right? So this darkness comes, this darkness comes from, from that in that work, okay? Um, in, uh, in other works, uh, if I talk about now Pantheon and Unza Africa, uh, what might strike us as a bit stark um, is, um, is also in general, the aesthetic of the work. So for example, Pantheon takes a lot of cues from 1930s, 1940s, Hollywood glamour Hollywood. photography, okay? So the, the stark that you see there can also be like quite a literal stark because the, work, the, the works have very deep and intense shadows and contrast um, because photographs were lit in a very different way back then than they were then in more recent, uh, in, in more recent decades. Um, 
in um, in yesterday tomorrow, which of course looks very different because it's really um, it's really the formal language of ancient Egyptian art brought into 21st century media. Um, it might be, yes, it might be clinical in the way that uh, Egyptian art is quite clinical because the Egyptian thing, art. The thing but, with, with that work is also that you need to actually see it up close and uh, on the computer screen, these images cannot do justice to the enormous amount of detail. Um, it's not just a matter of cutting and pasting. Uh, there is so much work involved and uh, just as uh, you need to look carefully at Egyptian art and then realize, oh, wait a minute, the, the face is in profile, but the eye is actually from the front. And even though the, the chest is turned towards me, the hips are facing left or right. And then you start thinking like, oh, and they have two left feet and they have two right hands. And then you start to realize that uh, Egyptian art is composed. It looks natural, but it actually isn't. And the same with yeah. your, your work in Yesterday Today, that at first you think, oh, that's a photo. And then, oh, wait a minute. No, that cannot be a photo. Uh, and and that, it is. And that amount of detail is, is not very easy to, uh, to convey over. Uh, you know, Branko, one thing, one thing I would add to the, to the question real quick, because it did, you know, you did get with that question at a very central intent of mine. Um, the images are supposed to be, remember when I said in the beginning, it's not about me and what I think, it's really about getting a thought process started within the viewer, okay? Um, so the images in a way, they're like, they're supposed to operate like Rorschach tests. So um, there is supposed to be aspects about them that feel quite, yes, in a sense, strangely objective, or clinical, and uh, and uh, it's it's part of getting uh, of getting the viewer rather than immediately being able to put it into some kind of preconceived mental drawer to create a tension between what is understood and what is not understood to start to start the thinking process. So that mm -hmm. is why there is a certain um, detached quality that runs through the work. So you got at something yeah. very essential with that question, I think. I saw, I saw a question pop by uh, and uh, that was whether uh, the exhibition will get published too, if there will be a catalog. Uh, obviously, uh, the exhibition is just being pitched today for the first time. Um, we would love to have uh, an, a catalog. Uh, I, it would be amazing if we could combine uh, your work with objects from uh, from two different museums, and to explain all the things that we want to achieve with uh, with that, and it would be a shame if you could not have uh, a catalog published to with with uh, invited essays um, to really express the thought process that went behind all of this. But of course, all of that is pipe dreams. Um, first of all, we need to get this project rolling to get a third partner, at least one uh, additional partner. Uh, and then hopefully in, in maybe two or three years, uh, people can come to the Tampa Museum of Art uh, and uh, hear Mark talk about it because obviously he would then come and, and give a lecture or two uh, and uh, see this uh, pitch uh, have come into reality. Brittany, are there any other questions maybe from Facebook or uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to raise a hand or ask a question? Uh, at this time, I am not seeing any additional questions, but while we give somebody perhaps a moment to finish typing, uh, you all will receive a survey at the end of today's lecture. So if by chance you didn't get a chance to ask your question, please don't hesitate to put it in the comment section of that survey and we can do our best to get back to you, um, but you will need to include an email address. The survey is anonymous otherwise. And I'd like to thank everybody for their participation in today's program. Yeah, and uh, thanks for me as well. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. It's been a Thank great pleasure. Uh, and uh, let's hope that we can uh, turn this into reality. Thank you all for joining us. Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.